Throughout the history of warfare, there have been moments where the way in which battle was conducted changed dramatically. These revolutions were often brought about by either a shift in operational doctrine, the advent of new technology, or, as was often the case, both, with one being a result of the incorporation of the other. In this, the second in our Weapon File series, we are going to be examining the genesis, introduction, and legacy of a new weapon that appeared in the middle of World War II, one that was met with early skepticism and then went on to influence generations of infantry weapons afterwards. This is the story of the STG-44 and the birth of the assault rifle. But first, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, World of Tanks, for making this video possible. Combat tactics can often tell you a lot about how a person thinks. Are you an all guns blazing kind of person or do you prefer to hang back and pick off your enemies one by one? Do you prefer open fields or urban war zones? World of Tanks has thought all about that. With over 40 battle arenas and 600 tanks, there's always a new way for you to play and discover exactly how you want to leave your division to a resounding victory. The game is perfect for fans of military history like us, and World of Tanks has given us an exclusive offer to share with you. World of Tanks is already a free-to-play game, but if you register by using the link in our description and the code TANKMANIA, you'll get a ton of incredible perks, including 7 days premium access, a tier 5 Excelsior tank, and 250k of credits. You'll also have 3 tier 6 rental tanks that you can use in 10 battles each. You'll get the Tiger 131, Cromwell B, and the T-3485M. This offer is only for new users, so hop to it if you've never played before and hit the ground running with these amazing bonuses. World of Tanks is available on all your devices, including PC, console, and mobile, so you can play anywhere this season. Thanks again to World of Tanks for sponsoring this video. Register using the link in our description and the code TANKMANIA to experience the thrill of devising the perfect battle plan and feeling like a real tank commander taking part in a furious armored offensive. Welcome to Wars of the World. In 1836, gunsmith Johann Nichols von Dreis produced a new rifle intended for use by the Prussian army that would radically change infantry weapon design for the next 100 years. Known as the Dreis needle gun, it outwardly resembled earlier muzzle-loading rifles, but differed in that it used a bolt handled by the operator to load a new round into the breech at the rear of the barrel and additionally eject a spent cartridge after firing. Compared to the older weapons, this bolt action system allowed for a much higher rate of fire, in the region of 6 rounds per minute, greater accuracy over longer ranges, and greater durability. Once the benefits of the bolt action rifle were realized, every major power in the world soon began manufacturing their own, and the bolt action rifle would dominate the battlefield well into the 20th century. Many of these weapons achieved legendary status, such as the British Lee Enfeld 303 and the American M1903 Springfield. These weapons served well for the types of warfare encountered during the following decades, where large formations of infantry continued to meet, often out in the open, firing at one another until one side ran out of either bullets or men. However, the sciences of the Industrial Revolution brought with it a new, frightening weapon system that looked set to completely change the nature of warfare. That weapon system was the rapid-firing machine gun, and was proven in the opening rounds of the Great War in 1914, where it was not uncommon for French soldiers to march towards the Germans wearing their traditional blue tunics into battle. After untold bloodshed, it was realized tactics were going to have to change. The threat of machine guns and artillery forced the construction of trenches that were difficult to destroy and nearly suicidal to attack with infantry, still clutching their trusty bolt-action rifles. 
even if a soldier managed to survive the rain of machine gun bullets across no man's land and made it to an enemy trench, he would likely be able to get off just one or two shots at his enemy before he was himself struck with return fire. It was clear to military planners that infantrymen needed more rapid firing weapons to give them any sort of chance of successfully assaulting a well defended enemy position. This gave rise to the development of the submachine gun, a handheld, rapid firing weapon that often utilized pistol sized bullets. In the final moments of the war, the German army created specialist stormtroopers armed with Berman MP 18s and used them to stunning effect, charging Allied positions. But the major drawback of these weapons was their range, which was often only a fraction of the bolt action rifles. As such, they were viewed largely as support or specialist weapons after the war, and armies continued using bolt action weapons, often little improved over the ones used in World War I. However, even before the Great War, mines were already working on incorporating the technology of the machine gun into the battle rifle to give every infantryman a significantly greater rate of fire. The wonderfully named Danish inventor Soren H. Bang, for example, patented a rifle in which the bolt action was performed by the gas created from the propellant charge of one round firing, pushing a cone-shaped fixture forward instead of relying on the operator's hand. Despite Bang making a series of such rifles, they were unfortunately too unreliable for any serious use, but his design would later be perfected and incorporated into some early automatic rifles. Real change started to come with the adoption of semi-automatic rifles, with the most important being the US M1 Garand rifle, which entered service in 1937. Instead of being fully automatic, Garand and its contemporaries fired one round with every single pull of the trigger and then automatically reloaded the next, the gas from the round just fired, again being used to work the reloading mechanism. While a well-trained infantryman could fire up to 15 rounds a minute with a contemporary bolt-action rifle, a soldier equipped with the M1 could fire up to 60, and this gave US forces a tremendous advantage in combat during the early years of World War II. However, some disadvantages remained. It was still a heavy weapon, and its on-block clip with its distinctive ejection sound only afforded it eight rounds and was complex and often problematic. When war loomed for a second time in Europe, many predicted that it would be a repeat of the Great War, with large armies fighting to a stalemate in vast trenches that cut across the countryside. Instead, more advanced tanks and aircraft made such static warfare obsolete. Now, war was a much more mobile affair, and the Germans, who were seemingly always eager to embrace new ideas, began to rethink the requirements for the ordinary infantrymen in this new arena. At the time of the invasion of Poland in 1939, the standard German rifle was the Bolt Action Carabiner 98K, an excellent weapon that could hit a target almost 4.7 kilometers away, making it a superb sniper rifle when fitted with a telescopic sight. But it weighed almost 9 pounds, had just a 5 round clip, and was 1.1 meters long, making it extremely cumbersome. German studies into typical combat experience during the early engagements found that most took place in the region of just 400 meters, meaning the phenomenal long-range performance of the 48s and the drawbacks in the design this dictated were simply not needed. Instead, the Germans realized that what they really needed was a weapon with a higher rate of fire. But their research also found that troops equipped with the submachine guns, even the superlative MP40, still had the opposite problem in that while easier to use, they lacked the range needed to be effective in anything other than close quarters. Also, the 9mm round used in such weapons was deemed to lack sufficient punch. Therefore, the task was given to German engineers to design a weapon with the rate of fire of a submachine gun, the stopping power of a rifle, have sufficient range for the type of combat experience thus far, and be ergonomic and relatively comfortable to use in almost any scenario. If they could achieve this, it would revolutionize weapon design. Working with what they already knew, the German design teams went about developing ways to rapidly load the 98 7.92 by 57 mm round, but it was found to be simply too powerful for effective automatic fire, placing great stress on the weapon and making it difficult for a German soldier to keep pointed where he was aiming during rapid fire. For chief designer at the Hainel company, Hugo Schmeisser, 
The solution seemed to lie in the shorter 7.92 by 33 mm Kurtz round, reloaded by a gas-operated long-stroke piston. He also elected to give the weapon selective fire options, meaning the infantryman using the weapon could switch between fully automatic and semi-automatic rates of fire, depending on the needs of the situation he found himself in. Schmeisser produced his new weapon, designated the Machine Carbine, or MKB-42, in 1942, and nearly 11,000 were built and issued to troops fighting in Russia, eventually seeing off competition for a similar weapon created by Karl Volta. Reports from its early frontline use were extremely positive, the weapon proving both powerful and reliable, prompting further development of Schmeisser's design, but the project was about to hit its biggest stumbling block. Briefed on the weapon in early 1943, Hitler was left unconvinced. He and many within his inner circle, who were themselves old soldiers of long over wars, argued that the smaller round would lack the reach and punch of the older rifles with their larger rounds and leave German infantry at a disadvantage. This despite the research and actual experience that said otherwise. The German leadership were also mindful of the fact that if Schmeisser's new weapon were adopted as the standard service rifle with its shorter round, it would leave the literal millions of bullets already manufactured redundant. Schmeisser and the new weapons advocates tried to protest, but in March 1943, the Fuhrer ordered work on the project to be stopped. However, convinced they had a potentially war-winning weapon in development, Schmeisser and his team continued it under the guise of upgrading the MP40 submachine gun. Thus, the MKB-42 was redesigned, and the MP43, in limited production, was undertaken. As part of seducing Hitler to the new weapon, his own bodyguards were soon equipped with it, so that he started to see them every day, subtly opening his mind to their wide-scale adoption. Finally, by the autumn of 1943, the supporters of the project were confident enough to approach Hitler once again with a plan for wide-scale adoption. The situation on the Eastern Front especially was what finally tipped the argument in Schmeisser's favor. German troops armed with Karabiner 98s and other traditional rifles were facing waves of Soviet troops armed with the awesomely powerful PPSH-41 submachine gun. While the German troops were able to kill many of them with their rifles before the Soviets got in range, there were so many Soviets attacking at once that eventually at least some would make it to German positions where they unleashed the awesome firepower of their cheaply made but effective weapons. By contrast, troops equipped with the MKB-42s and MP-43s were reporting that they were able to respond to such human wave assaults with tremendous firepower compared to regular units. The weapons, of which the differences between were minor, were able to act like a machine gun against the Soviet attacks, laying down a high rate of accurate fire, and still give them an effective close-quarters weapon for combating any Soviet troops that made it to their position. In short, the efficiency and lethality of the German troops had been greatly increased. Hitler finally gave the new weapon his blessing, and yet another change was soon given to the new gun as it went into production the MP44. However, Hitler himself disliked this designation, finding it inappropriate for what it was. He therefore personally coined a new designation reflecting this new type of weapon, the Sturmgewehr, or Assault Rifle. The Sturmgewehr 44, often shortened to the ST44, was so revolutionary that it wouldn't look too out of place in the armies of today. The influence of submachine guns on the design is obvious, with the pistol grip and large downward-facing magazine, and it was generally comfortable to use, although weighed in at around 13 pounds with a full magazine. A soldier operating the weapon could switch between semi-automatic and fully automatic fire modes by way of a switch on the left side, which he could thumb down or up with his right hand on the pistol grip. Depending on which mode he was firing in, effective range varied between 300 and 500 meters, well outside the range of the PPSH-41. A rather unusual innovation of the STG-44 was that part of the lower receiver occupied by the pistol grip could swing out from the magazine well. This opened the rifle up to allow for efficient cleaning and reassembly, and consequently greatly improved the weapon's reliability, providing, of course, the soldier took the time to do so. 
However, the STG-44 was far from perfect. It's almost futuristic for 1944 stamped steel construction, meant that the barrel assembly and foregrip covering it were prone to overheating, resulting in some German soldiers applying mittens to their left hand for protection. Also, the recoil spring extended all the way to its wooden stock, which meant any damage to the stock had a habit of jamming the rifle. This being one of the biggest criticisms laid out by the British investigation into their foe's new weapon, leading them to produce a damning report, claiming the assault rifle concept would never catch on. Without a doubt, however, the biggest criticism of the STG-44 from troops in the field concerned its distinctively curved 30-round magazine. The magazine simply didn't fit snugly in the weapon well, leading it to wiggling during rapid firing. This naturally led to some jamming issues, which were partly alleviated when German soldiers realized it mostly happened when the magazine was full and at its heaviest, and so they took to only loading around 25 rounds instead of the maximum 30. Curiously, this was not a unique problem to the STG-44, and several German and Allied automatic weapons suffered from this flaw. In early 1945, new magazines were issued that had been modified to only permit 25 rounds to be loaded at one time. Germany's re-equipment program for the rifle, dictated by Hitler, was, like many of his goals during this late period of the war, rather ambitious to say the least. The plan called for the production of 4 million rifles, with a firm order for 1.5 million already placed, to be constructed at three factories in Germany and one in Austria. Supporting the weapon was an order for 400 million rounds of 7.92 by 33 mm Kurz ammunition. However, such figures were pure fantasy. During its short production life, the STG-44 and its predecessors combined only managed a total of 425,977 weapons. Compare this to the 6 million PPSH-41 submachine guns and 5.4 million M1 Garand rifles. With chronic shortages of resources and manpower, coupled with a relentless Allied bombing campaign reducing German industry to ashes, the STG-44 would, like the ME-262 jet fighter and various other weapon systems in Germany's arsenal by the end of 1944, prove to be ahead of its time but rendered ineffective by the sheer weight of numbers of conventional weapons pitted against it. While American assessments of the weapon during the war were often as scathing as those produced by their British allies, the Soviets were intrigued by it. It has long been rumored that the famous Soviet AK-47 was a copy of the STG-44. However, this is not entirely true. The AK-47 certainly takes inspiration from the STG-44, but then so did a number of other weapons. Eventually, the Western Allies too began to adopt new weapons that followed the formula established by the STG-44. The STG-44 set the standard for the bulk of modern assault rifles that would follow in the decades that came afterward, with only the so-called bullpup types like the British SA-80 bucking the trend. And so, in that regard, while its contribution to Germany's war effort was relatively minimal, its impact on weapon design can never be overstated. And there you have the tale of the birth of the assault rifle. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.